In the previous example, we saw that the fracture strength for a tension member was dependent upon the net section area. But rather than use the net section area, we said we were going to use an effective area. And so our full definition for the effective area is that it's the net section area times the shear lag factor, capital U. So what is shear lag, anyways? Well, shear lag is a structural phenomenon where part of the cross-section is subjected to higher stresses, while other portions of the cross-section have little to no stress at all. One of the classic examples of shear lag is a single angle tension member. And you can see there below, I have that single angle tension member drawn out, uh, as well as a stress distribution acting on that angle. So what even causes shear lag in a connection such as this? Well, largely shear lag is typically caused by the geometry of the connection. And basically it comes down to what portions of the member are connected and what portions of the uh, member are not connected. All right, so you're probably saying, when am I going to see shear lag? Right, well, you're going to find shear lag in lots of different connections. Uh, angle connections are one of the major ones that we see shear lag in a lot. And uh, we have angle uh, tension members a lot of times in trusses just because they're very easy to construct and they're pretty cheap. So we can see that shear lag connection located above us. You can take a look in at that angle. You see where those four bolts come in. The angle is connected on one element only. So only the bottom leg is connected. So that angle will experience shear lag in this connection. All right, to help you process what exactly shear lag is, um, I have this demonstration here where I've spared no expense. Um, so anyhow, we have this angle, right? And we said that the angle member is one of these that typically shows shear lag. And it's pretty, uh, it's pretty good to use it. Now, this is a little bit small to use. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and blow this up and I have a version that I made out of paper. And again, you can make this version out of paper at home too. Uh, so it, in this demo, I have the paper attached at one side and now I have an angle member, right? So you're looking at the bottom leg of the angle and you're looking at the outstanding leg or the top leg of the angle. Now, in a case, if I was to grab both the top and the bottom plate and pull, you can see here that we have uniform stress in the entire member. Hopefully you can see the paper is tensed up a little bit and the member is, you know, it's holding its shape, it's in full contact. Um, so this is what we say is uh, shear lag, has no shear lag, because all elements of the member of the cross section are connected. So what that means is both the bottom plate element and this vertical plate element are connected at the connection. And you know, imagine I'm either bolting or welding these to something to where I'm grabbing. Now, what happens uh, when we have shear lag, it's when we don't have a condition like this, where all parts of the cross-section are connected. Um, so for this angle, a lot of times we only connect the bottom plate, because it's connected to a gusset plate, you know, welding or bolted, but the outstanding angle is not connected. And you can see, as soon as I let go of that, it kind of flops to the side. Um, but if we continue to follow the stress Eventually, we see the stress is still developing in this portion because it's connected on both sides on the, on the other side. It's only on the side where I connected it with one that uh, this uh, cross-section is not being utilized. And you can see it's not having the stress. So I want you to go back to uh, mechanics and materials when I talked about the little stress people, right? And I said like uniform stress is like uniform marching and it's using the whole angle. Um, but in this particular case, as soon as we, you know, don't have a uniform connection, if we're only connected on one side, if we had uniform marchers in the member out here, but we only had exits around the outside of the bottom of our uh, bottom plate, all these people are going to gradually start to filter down into this area so that they can kind of get out the exit. So that's my little stress people analogy. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. 
Um, otherwise, you can just see that this is highly stressed and basically in this region, we are not fully utilizing the full cross-section. We're only utilizing a portion of the cross-section. Um, so because we're using a portion of the cross-section, we can only take a percentage of the gross section area as being what we call effective. So when we talk about shear lag, we're gonna have what we call the effective area, and that effective area is going to be the shear lag factor, which is capital U, times the net section area at that location. After seeing that demonstration, hopefully this figure makes a little bit more sense. When we're at the connection, we see that portions of the cross-section are not really effective in resisting the load. And so therefore, we cannot use the entire net section area at the connection in the fracture strength, but rather we have to take an effective area in which we're basically getting rid of those portions that aren't contributing. However, this stress, as we look further down the member, will eventually transfer to sort of the portions that are not used. And it's is transferred uh, due to the forces of shear. And so shear will eventually get that out to the full uh, uniform stress condition at the middle. Uh, there's just sort of a lag between the uniform stress condition at the middle and at the connection, and hence the name shear lag. To come up with the shear lag factor, I'll point you to the AISC manual in table D3.1. Uh, we're going to talk about just a couple of cases though. Uh, most of our connections fall into either case one or case two. So case one is for members where all cross-sectional elements are connected. So for instance, this W shape, you can see the flange, the web, and the bottom flange are all connected. So this would have a U of one. Most plate connections also fall in this category. Case two is one minus X bar over L where X bar here is the distance from the centroid of the connected area to the plane of the connection. Uh, we'll go in detail a little bit more about this on the next page, but I really want to warn you that X bar and L are not tabulated in the manual. So you'll go to part one and you'll see values for X bar, but this is not the X bar that's referred to in this equation, one minus X bar over L. So just a word of caution to you, uh, you have to, basically come up with uh, X bar here on your own using your mind. And this is just a quick look at table D3.1. You'll see a bunch of different cases in there. We see some for tubes, some for different weld lengths, uh, some uh, extra stipulations there in seven and eight. But by and large, most of our cases fall within one and two. So that's what we're gonna focus on. Let's take a look at some examples for this calculating the shear lag factor U. So most of these cases are all going to be covered by case two, um, with the exception that these single angles up in the top left-hand corner, they could also fall under case eight. Um, but we see we're allowed to use either case two or case eight. So when we look at the members, we talked about uh, for case two, the formula is one minus X bar over L. So I want to basically show you what X bar is. X bar is the distance from the center of gravity of the cross section to the plane of the connection. So you can see here in the single angle member, the plane of the connection is where the angle rests on the plate. And then the center of gravity is the center of gravity for the angle member. So this is where we would get X bar to put into our shear lag factor equation. Now we are able to use table 1-7 to come up with the value for X bar. Um, but again, I just want to warn you that it's not going to be necessarily X bar in that table. So you'll have to pick either between X bar and Y bar, depending upon how the angle is oriented onto the plate, whether it's the long leg or the short leg that's attached to the plate will make a difference um, and the X bar that you want to use in the equation might not be X bar quote in the table. Let's look at the next example. We have a WT shape that's attached to a plate. Again, we have that long stem that's not attached to the plate. So that is an element that's not connected and therefore we'll have shear lag. This falls under case two as well. And so 
we locate the center of gravity for this WT member and we draw that to the plane of the connection, again, where the two shapes meet. And that is the value for X bar. Here, we're going to be able to use table 1-8 for the properties of the WT member. Um, but again, when we look at that table 1-8, we'll see that the value we really need to pull out of the table will be referred to as Y bar, not X bar. Let's take a look at the double channel section now. Even though the double channel, when you consider both sides, has a center of gravity that matches up with the center of gravity of the plate, shear lag doesn't really work like that. Um, basically, there's still going to be portions of the cross section that aren't going to be fully utilized because those outstanding flanges of the channel are not connected. So you can see there, I've gone ahead and just looked at one side, and you can then come up with the X bar for the right hand channel, and it's going to be the same as for the left one. And you can still use the U equals 1 minus X bar over L equation to come up with the overall shear lag factor for this connection. Lastly, we have these W shape connections. I'm going to take a look at the one on the right first. So when we consider the W shape, right, you can see that the flanges are attached to the plate, but the web is not. So the web is an element that's not connected, so it's going to experience some sort of shear lag. We see again that this falls in the case two. If you imagine how much force comes to the top plate, you could imagine just the top T that I've shaded in green there. So once we have that identified, just find the center of gravity of that T shape and then find the distance from that center of gravity to the plane of the connection and you will have X bar. Hopefully this looks a lot like the case right above it um, where we had the WT attached to a plate. So what I would recommend is that when you have a W shape like this you can actually directly use the same results as for a WT. First, you'll just have to kind of figure out what the equivalent WT section is for the W shape. So at the beginning of the year, we discussed that WT members are cut from W shapes. So basically, the equivalent WT for a W shape would just be, you know, take that W shape and take its nominal depth and divide by two and take its weight divide by two and then you can find the suitable equivalent WT using table 1-8. Finally, we're going to consider the W shape where only the web is connected to the connecting plates and not the flanges. So again, we're going to experience shear lag in the flanges. Again, you want to draw what is going to kind of contribute to uh, each plate. And so the shaded area in green there is the area of the eye shape that I would expect to go to the right plate. This looks like the channel section, but it's not uh, simple. Uh, unfortunately, there's no way to really get this quickly at this point in our steel design lives. So just go ahead and use statics with the shape in green to come up with the center of gravity. And then once you have the center of gravity from statics, you can then figure out what X bar is. We'll have a lot of practice in this class in coming up with what the shear lag factor are for a bunch of these different connections. But let's look at this example. Here we have a W8 by 40 that's connected to two splice plates. The question asks us to solve for the gross area and the effective area for the W8 by 40 tension member. Again, we want to think what gross section area means. That's the portion of the member kind of out in the middle where we're utilizing the full uh, cross-sectional area to resist the load P. And then we have the net section or our effective area that's happening at the uh, location where we have the bolts drilled. So hopefully by now you have figured out, okay, AG is going to be pretty easy. I can just look this up 
in table 1-1, one -one, for a W8 by 40 member, I open my manual and I find that the W8 by 40 member is 11.7 inches squared. Great. One of the easiest questions we'll probably ever get in our SEAL class, right? All right, the next one's going to be where we kind of apply the knowledge we learned on the previous page of notes. So we look at AE, the effective area, and we said that that is U times the net section area. So we have to come up with U, and then we go back to those different kind of geometries, and we said that U follows case 2 for this particular connection. So case 2 is U equals 1 minus X bar over L. In addition to U, because this is a bolted connection, we also have to determine the net section area. And so just as a reminder, the net section area is our gross area minus the number of bolt holes that are missing times the nominal diameter of the bolt plus an eighth of an inch, all times the thickness of where those bolt holes go through. So let's go ahead and take a look at the net section area. So I'm coloring kind of in red there on the I shape. This is going to be equivalent to the gross area of the cross section. However, we have these bolt holes missing. And so this is on the line where we're taking the net section area. And we have four bolt holes missing. So in this case, n is going to be 4 because at that portion of the cross section we are missing 4 bolt holes. Now this is the nominal diameter which we're taking as the diameter of the bolt plus an eighth of an inch for our fracture calculations and the portion that's missing is then the thickness here. And so from this figure you can see that the thickness t that we need in our equation for net area that thickness needs to be the thickness of the flange. And we can find the thickness of the flange in table 1-1, where we also pulled out uh, the answer previously. So when we calculate the net section area, we have the gross section area, which is 11.7 inches squared. Then we're going to subtract out four bolt holes. The nominal diameter of the bolt holes, uh, the bolts that we're using is 7 eighths inch, that's what we were given, uh, plus an eighth of an inch. And then we're also going to multiply this now by the thickness of the flange. In this particular case, the thickness of the flange is 0 0.560 inches. I just also want to point out here, uh, we say that these are standard holes. So if we go back to the hole, right, we said we drill holes uh, the size of the bolt plus a sixteenth of an inch. That's a standard hole uh, as it's defined. There's also other oversized holes, and you can look into the manual for more details on that. All right, getting back to our calculations, we can sharpen our pencils and uh, go ahead uh, we go through and we calculate the net section area is 9.46 inches squared for this particular member. Now we have to address the shear lag factor. So for the shear lag, we said to the top plate, that section that I tried to outline in green there, uh, is going to be what portion of the cross section that travels uh, or transfers stress to the top plate. And then the center of gravity of that portion is then going to be, or X bar is going to be the distance from the center of gravity of that portion to the plane of the connection. If we kind of redraw that green outlined area, that is a WT shape. And I said we could come up with the equivalent WT by taking the W shape and dividing it by two. So a W8 by 40 cut in half 
would become a WT4 by 20. So looking up the value for X bar from table 1-8 for WT4 by 20, we see that X bar is going to be 0 0.735 inches. And I just, again, want to stress that, you know, this is really, you know, what's listed as Y bar in the table. But uh, when we use 1 minus X bar over L, that X bar is a variable that we want to, you know, make sure we're using our minds to calculate. Finally, we need to determine L. L is the length over which it's connected. So in this particular case, from the first bolt line to the last bolt line, that is what we define as L. So L also has to come from our connection geometry. Looking at this problem, L is going to be 6 inches from the first bolt line to the last line. So then we can go ahead and calculate U. U is going to be 1 minus 0.735 over 6. And so we calculate U to be 0 0.88. It's kind of traditional that we round u to the nearest hundredth uh, as we don't really believe that this equation, this 1 minus x bar over l, this isn't really accurate out to thousands or ten thousands. When we come out to the effective area, the effective area now is 0 0.88 times 9.46 inches squared or 8.32 inches squared. And again, I want to point out that the U factor, that 0.88, just basically means that at the net area where we're expecting fracture, basically we think 88% of the connection, 88% of the area is being utilized at that point. Let's take a look at example three now. Example three has the same member, uh, and the only thing that's really changed about it is how uh, the type of connection, so it's no longer a bolted connection, it's now a welded connection. And then the length of the connection also changed. So from the very forward edge of the weld to the back edge of the weld, uh, we're given that as 10 inches. So this is going to be very similar to example two um, with those two exceptions. All right, so since it's very much like the previous example, the gross area is going to be remain the same, 11.7 inches squared. Our formula for the effective area, A sub E, is equal to U times the net section area, A N. Again, we're going to have this case where only this WT is what's traveling to the top plate. And we can calculate X bar. We'll calculate X bar in the same manner that we did in example two. So X bar still remains 0 0.735 inches. L for our connection has changed as well. So in this case, L is 10 inches the total length of the connection. So let's go ahead and get our calculations written down. So we have the effective area U. U is still uh, 1 minus X bar over L for case 2, except X bar is 0 0.735 inches, and now L has changed to 10 inches. So this gives us a new value for U. U in this case is going to be 0 0.93, which basically means 93% of the area is effective at the connection. Because we have a welded connection, the net area is going to equal our gross area. We only do the net area when we have to subtract out bolt holes. So for the welded connection, we don't have to subtract those bolt holes out. So now we can do our calculations. The effective area will be U, 0.293 times the net area, 11.7 inches squared. So for this particular example, we get that the effective area is 10.88 inches squared. All right, so hopefully we have a good handle on calculating shear lag factors and effective areas. 
Uh, we'll be using these as we continue to calculate the yielding strength and fracture strength of different tension members.